All right, guys, uh, welcome to chapter seven. We're gonna look at patterns of inheritance. And in this video, we're gonna look at 7.1 monohybrid crosses. Uh, this is going to be a long one, so strap into your seats and get ready, all right? All right, we're gonna start by looking at Mendel's laws of inheritance. Now, based on his experiments with pea plants, uh, Mendel developed three laws of inheritance. The first one is called the law of segregation, which is when alleles are separated when the gametes form so that each gamete, the sperm or the egg, is going to carry one allele for the gene, okay? The second law is called the law of independent assortment. Now, this term, you've seen this in the process of meiosis. The segregation of alleles uh, of one gene is going to be independent of the segregation of alleles of another gene. Um, this happens during the metaphase when the chromosomes line up and then uh, when they pair up and then they are being split into different ends that ratio that's going to be independent of one another so it's like a random card shuffle okay the third one is the law of dominance alleles for recessive traits are going to be masked by alleles for dominant traits and here you can see this table uh, for all the dominant traits up the top and all the recessive ones down the bottom. So uh, flower color, for example, is, uh, dominant is purple, uh, whereas, uh, you know, pod color is dominant is going to be green versus yellow, okay? Now, uh, how does this play out? So if you were to imagine, uh, you know, the particular cell, um, you know, when it goes through uh, meiosis, uh, you're going to get uh, segregation uh, when the gametes are being formed. And the during that meiosis process there are one to four possible outcomes for this particular cell on this side and one to four ratios here and that's independent assortment you can see there um, despite the fact that they line up next to each other you don't know whether purple is going to be with dark green or light green right so purple dark green purple light green or uh, pink is going to be with dark green or light green and so you got one two three four different possible outcomes because of independent assortment and then in uh, the law of dominance, when you have fertilization and you get that zygote, that new cell, um, you know, one of them is going to be expressed over the other uh, because they're going to have that dominance relationship, okay? Now, uh, genetic crosses uh, is when we deliberately mate two organisms to, exam uh, to examine the pattern of inheritance uh, of a particular trait, right? So um, there are four types of crosses that we're going to be looking at. Uh, monohybrid cross, dihybrid cross, test cross, and a reciprocal cross. This is a monohybrid cross here, running across two generations. This is a dihybrid cross over here, uh, running across one generation, right? And a test cross and reciprocal cross uh, are smaller aspects of the monohybrid and dihybrid crosses that we're gonna look at, okay? Uh, let's start with the monohybrid cross, right? A monohybrid cross is a cross between two individuals with different alleles for one gene. So we are looking at one trait and one trait only, or a single gene locus only, sorry, not one trait. Um, and uh, we're going to determine the genotype and phenotype outcomes of the offspring. That's the purpose of the cross. We want to figure out what are the what's the likelihood of the, the, the offspring being like this or having the trait or not having the trait, etc. Okay? Uh, a monohybrid cross is represented by a Punnett square, and you can either run over one generation or even several generations. Um, so, for example, um, to understand how this works, right? Let's say you have two two plants, one tall and one short, and then you perform a cross, and then that cross results in a second generation, which we call the F1 generation or the first filial generation. And then let's say you take two individuals from that generation and you mate them, and then you get an F2 or a second filial generation, right? So that's that's a that's a that's a cross running over two generations, right? Um, and that's that's the Punnett square represented there. Okay. Now a Punnett square is just a diagram to represent all the possible outcomes, right? Um, and here is a um, a a Punnett square showing uh, the the capital capital letter A or lowercase letter A, and you can see that this little sperm here that's representing the male gametes so you got one possible here one possible here and then the female egg that's here and here and you have these particular possible outcomes okay so when you conduct a monohybrid cross you need the Punnett square shown and then you also need to list or label the genotypic and the phenotypic ratio to express what the the frequency is right so that's that's that little statement down here and down here now I'll explain what that is in a second all right so uh, we're gonna go with an example, right? So let's go with albinism, right? Albinism is when you have a congenital absence of pigmentation, it means there's no absence, uh, so there's no, there's, no, um, there's no pigmentation since birth, congenital means at birth, uh, usually in the skin, the hair, or the eyes. So here are different organisms uh, with albinism, so there's a white 
echidna, a uh, ferret, and you can see their white fur with the red eyes, yeah, white pigmentation uh, with the red eyes. And likewise, here is an indigenous woman uh, who has albinism with her uh, child who has normal pigmentation. Okay, now. Uh, Pigmentation is caused by the level of melanin, right, produced by special cells called melanocytes. The TYR gene located on chromosome 11 encodes for the enzyme tyrosinase, which is responsible for the uh, catalyst, uh, sorry, for the catalyst for production of melanin, right? If you have, uh, you know, the enzyme tyrosinase, you produce melanin. If you have melanin, you have normal pigmentation, right? So a capital A allele means you produce normal enzymes, which results in normal pigmentation. But a lowercase a produces a faulty enzyme. That means no melanin. No melanin means no pigmentation. No pigmentation means you become an albino. And albinism is an autosomal complete dominance inheritance pattern, right? Which means uh, it is autosomal, it occurs on chromosomes 1 to 22, and it's complete dominance, which means if you have um, one copy of this, it will mask the other one, the recessive, the faulty one, and you don't express the trait at all, right? So let's conduct a monohybrid cross. Let's start with a cross between a homozygous dominant male with a homozygous recessive female using a Punnett square. And then we're going to determine the genotypic and phenotypic ratios in the F1 generation. Okay. So uh, for the first one, if you want to give it a shot, obviously you can just pause the video and try it yourself. If not, uh, obviously uh, I'm going to go through all the possible outcomes there for you. Okay. So homozygous dominant. Homozygous means exactly the same two letters. Um, and then dominant means they're going to be capitals, right? So the male, capital A, capital A. Female, on the other hand, homozygous recessive is going to be the same letters that are small, right? Uh, so two lowercase a there. From there, you're going to just actually take this capital A and put it next to this lowercase a here. And then you end up with a genotype, capital A, lowercase a. Now you do the same here and here to give you this particular genotype, here and here to do this one here, and then here and here to do this one here, right? And now you get you get exactly the same results uh, in all conditions, right? So the genotypic ratio, capital A, capital A to lowercase, uh, capital A, lowercase A to lowercase A, lowercase A is zero four zero, right? Now, it, it's almost unnecessary to have uh, this one here and this one here, the zeros, um, and you can literally just say the genotypic ratio is 100% capital A, lowercase A, right? Because there is no difference. But I just put it there just so that you can see the ratios with the, all the different possible outcomes. So the phenotypic ratio, on the other hand, is whether or not they have the trait or they don't have the trait, right? So in this case here, um, individuals that are normal is going to be four, and then individuals that are albino is going to be zero. So, uh, sorry, that four is meant to be the other way around. So you got four, zero here, okay? This means that all the offspring are going to have a heterozygous genotype, capital A, lowercase a, but they have normal pigmentation, right? Uh, in this particular case, it's just a few terminologies to understand as well. If the parents are homozygous, it means they're true breeds. Homozygous means they're both the same. Uh, and so um, because uh, parents are capital A, capital A up here, that's true breed. And then lowercase a, lowercase a here, that's also a true breed. And um, we call this cross a hybridization because you end up with hybrids, capital A, lowercase a as well. Okay. Let's take it one step further. Let's go from first filial generation to the second filial generation, right? So you go from F1 to F2. So we're going to take two individuals from the F1 generation. Now, they're all the same. So it's going to be A, capital A, lowercase a in all conditions, right? The male and the female, right? And then we're going to cross them and we're going to see if we can come up with an F2 generation, right? So uh, if you cross them, you should now get a slightly different result from the previous Punnett square. Our genotypic ratio is capital A, uh, capital A, to uh, capital A, lowercase a, to lowercase a, lowercase a, being one, two, one, right? So one, two, and one, right? Uh, the phenotypic ratio is still three to one though. You know, the three out of one of them are normal because this capital A is going to mask the condition. Now, uh, in the F2 generation, we're going to say that 75% have a normal phenotype, whereas 25% are albino. Now, that's a, that's a pretty normal for two heterozygous um, crosses, right? You're always going to get that. Uh, when when they're too heterozygous, right? Uh, especially in dominant conditions. Uh, normal pigmentation is also what we call the wild type because the wild type is the most frequent occurrence, right? Whereas the albino is not going to be the wild type. Uh, let's uh, do another example of a monohybrid cross. So uh, this time we're going to go with a, a homozygous recessive male with a heterozygous female using a Punnett square. Um, and so homozygous recessive is lowercase a, lowercase a, and the female is going to be 
um, uh, capital A, lowercase a. And in this case here, you've got a 50-50 chance of being normal, but a carrier or um, uh, an albino. So you can see there that, that, that capital A is going to mask on the top two there. So the genotypic ratio is a one-to-one -one for capital A, capital A to lowercase a, lowercase a, right? Uh, and you have a one-to-one -one ratio of normal to albino, which means there's a 50-50% chance of either being a carrier or having albinism. Okay, uh, now we're gonna do another example of monohybrid cross. What happens when you have a monohybrid cross for incomplete dominance, right? So remember in the previous chapter, we had incomplete dominance where the dominant allele does not fully mask and you get this blend of uh, the two traits. So in this particular case, let's go with the Snapdragon's flower color. Snapdragon flower color red is the dominant trait, white is the recessive trait, um, and we're gonna use a different notation. We're gonna, I'm gonna use R with a subscript uh, one and two to represent dominant and recessive, okay? Because it is incomplete dominance, you have to be aware, obviously, you know, it, it, as it's incomplete dominance, you're going to get a blend if you mix red and white together. So if you mix red and white, you're going to get pink, right? Uh, and so R1, R2 is going to give you pink, right? Uh, and in all four conditions, you're going to get pink flowers, right? So the genotypic uh, ratios is going to be 100% R1, R2 and all 100% pink flowers for the phenotypic ratios, okay? Um, if you take from the F1 to the F2 generation, we're now going to get a different result again, right? Where let's say you take two individuals from the F1 generation, they're both going to have pink flowers because remember they all had pink flowers in the F1. And you're going to get R1, R2 here, R1, R2 here. And when you put the Punnett square together, you're going to get a genotypic ratio of 1, 2, 1, red, pink, and white, right? And now, notice how the phenotypic ratio is aligned with the genotypic ratio, right? One, two, one, that tells you it's incomplete. If it was complete, this should not be the case because uh, you should get red to white and that should be three to one ratio, right? But in this case here, one, two, one tells you that uh, it is an incomplete dominance. There's gonna be a 25% chance of red, 150% chance of pink and 25% chance of white, right? And then you can see there, that's how the diagram shows it playing out. All right, another example, uh, let's look at co-dominance. What happens when you have two alleles that are going to be dominant uh, and they're both gonna be fully expressed, right? So here are two examples. Obviously you can do any combination you want, but I just picked uh, two um, and just kind of represented them here. So let's say you have um, IA, uh, IB. So this person here, there's gonna have AB a, blood because you have one immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin B. Um, and you have lowercase i, lowercase i, right? That means that your genotypic ratio is gonna be i a capital lowercase i to i b capital lowercase i of two to two or one to one. And this there's a 50% chance of either a blood or b blood here, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you have an individual with, um, if you have an individual with um, blood type B with individual with blood type A, you can see there the combination now is one of every type, right? You can see A, B, A, B, and R, and, and two lowercase i, which is O blood, right? So, um, you know, if you were to do your ratios, uh, one, two, one, 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 and then one, 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 one as well. So you can see there that's a very uh, interesting individual there, right? Um, now, here's, here's a really, another really cool fact, right? If you have an individual with AB blood and you cross them with an individual with O blood, notice how um, you can only have A blood or B blood, but you can't have AB or O blood, right? So two parents with AB blood and O blood must have either A blood or B blood. They can't possibly have AB blood or O blood. Uh, it's usually a, a bit of a giveaway uh, if they're your actual parents. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to talk about test crosses. A test cross between an uncertain, sorry, a, t a test cross is a cross between an uncertain genotype, something that we don't know, with a homozygous recessive genotype to then try and figure out what that unknown genotype is, right? So for example, if an organism has a dominant phenotype, sometimes we don't know whether or not they're going to be homozygous or heterozygous because that dominant phenotype could be a complete dominance, right? In these cases, we're gonna do a test cross to figure it out, right? So for example, let's say uh, you've got a guinea pig and a guinea pig has black fur and black is the dominant, right? How do we know whether it's gonna be capital B, capital B, which is black, or capital B, lowercase b, which is still black because that, that capital B, that's gonna be expressed as black, right? What do we do? We're gonna test uh, that with a homozygous recessive, uh, which is going to be white fur, right? So two lowercase b's, and what do we get? 
let's say you put the female on the one side and then the male on the other side, which we don't know, right? So the individual female um, we know is white and it will have lowercase b. So we can go ahead and punch in the lowercase b on all four quadrants. And then what we do is we observe the offspring. What, how many offspring of each color do we get, right? So let's say, for example, we did it and then we got 27 black and 23 white. That's a lot of babies one guinea pig to have, right? But uh, you know, just for this particular sake, we'll, we'll go with these numbers, right? And because we have 27 black and 23 white, we know that these individuals with the black fur, they must have a capital B here. Why? Because if they have a lowercase b, it would have been white fur, right? And so this is capital B here, capital B here. And so this top one, that one should be capital B. This one on the other hand, that's white. So that's gotta be a lowercase b here and same here. And so now we can figure out that the parent's genotype, the, the, the male with the black fur is actually a heterozygous one, capital B with a lowercase b. Right, so that's a test cross. You do something that's unknown to figure out what the unknown is, right? And that's a diagram to kind of show you what that looks like. Okay, um, now, uh, last section, we're gonna look at what happens when it's not on an autosome, right? So when you have X-linked genes. All of our examples so far are located on autosomes, which are the first 22 pairs. However, there are traits that are considered X-linked and they are present on the X chromosome. We call these X-linked genes because they are on the X chromosomes and you're gonna be different uh, because males only have one copy of the X chromosome, right? Uh, examples, muscular dystrophy, uh, red-green color blindness, um, and hemophilia, which is a uh, blood clotting disorder, right? Now, a monohybrid for an X-linked trait is going to show different ratios from a standard autosomal trait. Why? Because the X chromosomes differ between males and females, okay? Let's go with an example. Let's go with DMD, muscular dystrophy, right? So Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD is a degenerative disease caused by a faulty dystrophin uh, gene, right? You get muscle weakness typically in uh, the thighs, the pelvis and the arms, and most people are unable to walk by the age of 12 onwards. It's uh, mostly inherited, um, but about a third of the cases are a bit of a spontaneous mutation, okay? Now, here are your alleles, right? Capital D, results in regular muscle formation because you have the right uh, allele for proper dystrophin production. Um, uh, lowercase d is faulty dystrophin, right? Um, and uh, in, as a result of that, you get um, DMD, right? Now, what are your possible combinations? Well, for females, there are three possible combinations. You either have two capital Ds, capital D, lowercase d, or two lowercase d's. And you can see here, only in the case of two lowercase d's will you get DMD, right? Now that means that DMD is a recessive trait. It is a X-linked recessive trait because it's on the X chromosome and it is only expressed when you have the recessive alleles present. If you have one dominant allele, it's gonna be masked. Now, DMD is actually a bit of an incomplete dominance because you can actually have mild symptoms, um, but it's kind of mostly treated as a complete dominance trait, right? So uh, for males, on the other hand, you have a different ratio. You only have a 50-50 chance. Why? Because you've got the Y chromosome, right? So you've got one X chromosome with either capital D or lowercase d, but the other one's a Y. So here, uh, DMD results in 50% of those, the, the, the possible outcomes, right? Uh, now, that means that males are more likely to develop DMD since the females with this particular chromo um, genotype here, capital D, lowercase d, they're gonna be masked from having the condition because of that extra X chromosome providing that little bit of extra um, protection, right? Uh, so let's go through all of our possibilities. So I'm gonna take all the possible combinations you can possibly get of these combinations. So we're gonna cross all of these combinations with each other and we're, and we're gonna see what we can get, right? So here's the first two, right? A bit of a no brainer. If you have two individuals with no DMD and let's say the female is homozygous dominant, uh, then uh, you're gonna get no individuals with DMD, pretty straightforward. Likewise, because it's recessive conditions, if the male and the female has it, that means they're all gonna have lowercase d's and they're all gonna get DMD, right? Now, what happens if I reverse that a little bit, right? So let's say the female doesn't have it, but the male does have it, right? So he's got a lowercase d here, but Sheeta has two capital D's on this side, right? Because the X chromosome is passed on to the daughters and the sons, right? And it's on the X chromosome, no one's going to have DMD. So the dad's X chromosome goes to the daughters, um, but they get masked by the mom's capital D, and so they're protected. Now, 
the dad's Y chromosome goes to the son. So that, that, that's irrelevant here. Despite the fact that he has DMD, his sons are not going to inherit it from him. On the other hand, if mom has DMD, two lowercase d's, but dad's fine, you can see there that the daughter inherits the dad's X chromosome. So they're going to be protected despite the fact that mom has it. But the sons, they're going to get the disease because they inherit the X chromosome from mom. And that's got the DMD or the faulty allele. So it doesn't matter if dad doesn't have it, the sons get it because of the mom. Uh, on the other hand, if let's say uh, the, the, the dad doesn't have it, but the mom's a carrier, you get a slightly different ratio again, right? So you have, um, uh, you know, uh, capital D here. Wow, so these guys are fine. And then lowercase d, but you know, because dad uh, doesn't have it, this daughter's, the daughters are fine, but the son has a one in four chance of getting it, right? A one in, one in two chance, sorry. Um, they, on the other hand, if you flip it, um, you, you now get a 50-50% ratio because mom's uh, lowercase d and dad's lowercase d results in this daughter having it as well, right? So if you count up the individuals, if I was to take all the possibilities, there were 12 possible outcomes I could get, right? Um, so for girls and 12 possible outcomes for boys, right? You know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Likewise with the boys, right? And if you look at your results, um, of the 12 possible outcome scenarios for each sex, right? Only three out of 12 result in DMD for the girls, right? However, six out of 12 individuals uh, result in DMD for the boys, which means girls only have a one quarter chance of getting it. Boys, on the other hand, have a one in half, uh, sorry, one in two chance of getting DMD. So that's why DMD is far more prevalent in males than it is in females because of that second X chromosome in the female masking it um, and DMD is a recessive trait, okay? Now, um, the pattern of X-linked inheritance can also be observed by conducting what we call a reciprocal cross, right? We can figure it out by performing two tests. The cross involves having a male with the trait and a female without the trait. And then you do a second test where the males don't have the trait and the females have the trait. And then you just look at the ratios. If the offspring ratios are different between the two tests, it's going to be a sex linked uh, condition, right? If the ratios are the same, then it should, you know, if it, sh it shouldn't matter whether the male has the trait and the female doesn't have the trait or the other way around, right? Uh, so a good example is uh, both the DMD that I just went through and also uh, paralysis in Drosophila fly. So they got this weird allele that uh, causes them to go through this weird seizure and paralysis, right? And then they actually recover with a second seizure before they just kind of get back and just kind of get on with their lives, right? If you cross a paralytic female with a normal male, right? Um, there is a one in half chance that the offspring will get it. 100% chance of the, the males will get it, right? Because it's the excellent condition. However, if you cross a normal female with a paralytic male, no individuals will get the condition. And that gives you an indication that because the numbers are different, even though we perform this reciprocal test cross, um, that tells us that it is sex linked and it's not on an autosome. Okay, all right, let's look at a slightly different condition. What happens if the X-linked condition is a dominant trait and not a recessive trait? So an example of that is vitamin D rickets. Uh, it's a genetic disorder where you get low levels of phosphate in the blood, and as a result of that, you get really soft and bendy bones, right? So here's normal bone formation, then here's an individual with rickets. Um, if you were to plot out the possible alleles, this time having a capital letter is going to result in the trait. That's why it's called an X-linked dominant condition, right? Because it's on the X chromosome and it's dominant, which means if you have the dominant uh, allele, it's going to be expressed, right? So the individual with a capital D is going to get a vitamin D rickets. Uh, individuals with the lowercase d is going to have a normal allele. Now, watch how in females, it comes up differently from the previous example of DMD, right? In the previous examples, if you had these two, you'd be normal. And then if you had this one, you'd have um, DMD. And on this time, because it's a dominant trait, if you have these two, you have the rickets condition. Whereas if you have two lowercase d's, you have the normal condition. Males is still 50-50, right? But it's uh, capital D rickets and then lowercase d normal. So now you get a reverse. Notice how having the heterozygous genotype for females is actually bad because now they are more likely to develop the disease because of the heterozygous capital D lowercase d genotype, okay? So that's how you would show up. And once again, if you drew the Punnett squares, it would look different. 
Okay, other conditions. So uh, you also have what we call Y-linked inheritance uh, when a trait is located on the Y chromosome and it's only passed from fathers to sons. Uh, which means females are never going to exhibit the trait since they don't have a Y chromosomes. All the sons are going to get it from the dad and you don't need a Pointer square because there's only one straightforward uh, representation, right? Uh, you also have this really weird thing called sex limited inheritance, right? Where it's not the same as X or Y linked inheritance. It occurs when a trait is expressed in a single sex, even though the genes are present on both sexes. So it doesn't have anything to do with the X or the Y chromosome. But, uh, you know, for, you know, kind of morphological examples prevent the condition from being expressed. So, for example, you know, prostate cancer is only expressed in males, even though the genes for the prostate is present in males and females, right? Because only males have the prostate. Females don't have the prostate. They have an analogous structure that is like the prostate, but they don't have a prostate. Uh, likewise with ovarian cancer. So, you know, the genes for it is present on both um uh both uh sexes but you know only females would develop ovarian cancer right okay that's it for this particular chapter thanks for tuning in with me and i hope you guys uh learned a lot there uh and in the next chapter we're gonna look at pedigree charts i'll see you guys then